Hello and welcome to another Retro Crazy. This time it's a lesser known Commodore 64 game system, but not a normal one. First of all, you can see where the cartridge would go in, except the cartridge port is not the way it should be sat. I picked this up recently from Pixel Planet Gaming in Leven. And the story behind it is that it is a, an X demo unit from a store. And it actually had a micro cart plugged in the back rather than using the actual cart on the top. And I could believe that because obviously with a cartridge in the top, running this as a demo, anybody could steal the cartridge. So having it locked inside is fine. And this is exactly how I got it. But what's odd is, I can't remember if there's meant to be a trapdoor system in here, but there's nothing. And the only other one I've seen, and it wasn't actually together when I got it. Let me pop the top shell off. The only other one I've seen, none of these were populated because obviously you're a, user port and tape port are not integral to, to the system. However, other than that, it's a functional Commodore 64. This still also has the keyboard header, which again, you would not normally expect to see on a proper 64 GS. Now, when I received this, this is exactly the condition I received it in. The screws are currently separate. Let me lift the, the motherboard out. It's all proper Commodore, 64 GS. Let me pop it to the side. And straight away I can see that these have not been used that much. There's a tiny little bit of wear and a little bit of marking, but they're clean and clear and pristine. And the motherboard itself is really nice condition. There's something on this corner, I'm not quite sure what it is, but we'll remove that. Everything else seems to be nicely done. But somebody was in the middle of a conversion, because I can get right underneath these pins. This is the original uh, flat connector, and somebody has cut these in preparation for lifting it and actually setting the cartridge slot vertically rather than horizontally. So what I would like to do for the rest of this video is look at sorting this so that it will actually work from the, the vertical position. Now, I do normally prefer things to be as they were, but in this instance, actually being able to use cartridges in it from the outside without having to strip a cartridge out of its casing would be a little bit more beneficial. Plus, to put it back to original condition, I'm going to have to replace this. So let's look at desoldering the rest of this, doing some cleanup, straightening the pins, and then refitting that connector. Well, we're down to three pins that are currently connected and refusing to let go. 
the two outer ones, which are connected to the ground plane on the other side, so there's a big area of copper to try and heat, and this one tiny little pin here. So what I'm going to try and do is heat up this one and try and pull the connector through, and then heat these two together, try and pull it through, and then just work it back and forward until I can get it clear, and then once it's clear, I can work on clearing these round pins on the outside. Now that that's clear, I'm going to try and clean up the last remaining holes. Now that the board's clean, I need to straighten all these pins, hopefully without breaking any, so we can look at refitting it the opposite way around. Make it look a little bit different. I'm going to do that slowly and carefully, just with a pair of pliers. Gently try and coax each one back to a straight position. Hopefully without breaking any. Well, here it goes. That's half down, other half to go. And provisionally I'm done. They're all now facing the right direction. All I've got to do now is persuade them to fit in there. Right, this back edge is in and lined up. And all I'm going to do now is keep a little bit of pressure on and gently tease each pin into hopefully a better place. This is going to be a lot of rinse and repeat because it's sitting on the pins and I don't know which one it's sitting on until I move it and then they'll drop down and hit another pin. All the pins now appear to be lining up, so pop it in until it's flat and flush, and then check all the pins are through. Which they are. And cartridge will indeed drop in there. So let's solder it all back up. I'm going to use the larger chisel bit on my soldering iron and it's easier just to run it along and add the solder as I go.
That's a theory. Let's see if I can manage. So that's everything now done, everything's cleaned up, everything's working. I have done a test fit, I don't need to cut any of these. They will all sit quite nicely in the case. And that's the way I think I'd like to leave it, using the original cartridge connector without damaging it any further. I have been doing some digging, and this is assembly 250469 revision A and that's one of the very very last revisions Commodore ever did and this is using the HMOS chipset where they took things like um, the PLA uh, and, and combined it with the TL Logic and came up with this um, 64 pin super PLA. They also changed the designation on some of the chips so the the, the 8565 um, is the new VIC-2 uh, HMOS and these are 5 volts not 12 volts so they're certainly not backward compatible with the the older machines um, and the 8580 uh, which was the upgraded uh, SID for for this as well. The other noticeable difference is the change to the memory, I think, where is it? No, I think, yeah, they've gone from uh, one bit to four bits, so instead of needing eight chips, they only require two. And now U4, here we go, U4, tucked away over here, is now the kernel and the basic ROM combined into one. So it's, it's, it's all condensed and, and component cost reduced, so this was one of the last cost saving measures. The GS model was released in December 1990 and out of the 20,000 units produced, Commodore managed to sell a whole whopping 2,000. Not surprising really when you consider that this was nothing more than a cut down Commodore 64, no keyboard etc etc. Yes, it had an extra little trick where it had a completely unique controller with a, a second usable button that wasn't tied uh, to the original, but you can use any of your original um, controllers and get the, the functionality. It also meant that none of the cartridge-based games would work because these weren't designed to take a keyboard at all and without those you, you have no keyboard control. What will be interesting when we go to test, we'll be finding out if this particular one does actually have the upgraded character animation. On a standard 64 you powered it on and you got your 64 bytes of RAM basic kicking in. However, with the GS model, which was designed to work with cartridge only, they updated the boot so that if there was no cartridge plugged in, you would get a character animation just simply saying insert cart. Now with this possibly having been, uh, I was told it was a prototype, I'm reckoning it may not have been a prototype but more likely a quickly put together store display, there are certain things that kind of give away the fact that that might be the case and for me the big one is the fact that the big metal shield that is normally visible over all of these has never been soldered in here. Never at all. There is some fresh, or what looks like some fresh solder here, which is possibly um, correct, but these, the big ground plane here, there is nothing. It's never had anything at all soldered onto it. It'll be interesting when we come to power it up. I have ordered a cap kit. That will be here within a week or so. So I will completely recap the board as well, but let's move on at the moment. One of the things I was told when I got it was that the LED didn't work. 
and the LED itself is fine. The connector seems fine, but there was an issue and it looks like somebody has just twisted the wires together and used some uh, electrical tape. When I did a, a test across it, there was nothing. There was no power. Now you can easily check an LED by taking a button cell. Now here is a button cell from the joystick tester that I have. These are little three volt cells and if it's the right way around, the LED will light. And all I'm doing is pushing the contacts either side. Now, don't worry if you get it the wrong way around, it won't damage the LED, it'll just not light. So if that doesn't work, flip them round and fingers crossed it should work. So that works. So I'm going to cut these, bear some fresh wire, use some heat shrink and I'm going to solder these up. So that's it all done, soldered, heat shrunk, twisted back together and ready to go back in. Next I'm going to check the original C64 power supply because I don't actually yet have a replacement power supply, something I've got to order up. So let's check the voltages on the original power supply. Now it is one of the later Commodore bricks and it should have two outputs, a 5 volt and a 9 volt AC. So 5 volt DC and 9 volt AC. That's the power on. I've got the plug here. I'm not sure if I can test it this way. I've not had the greatest success trying to hold these things, but the pins are a little bit further apart. So let's see what we can do. Again, try not to short anything out. So 5 volts, 5.15 volts on the 5 volt rail, which is absolutely fine, it's actually a good voltage. And now we're looking at the 9 volts on the AC. I really need to get something that holds these. And there's 10.41 on the AC, which again is a very good voltage because that'll get pulled down slightly once it's actually plugged in. So now the power supply has been tested. I now need to find out which of the pin headers that the LED gets plugged into. And looking at the board, I don't see any pin headers over this side at all, other than the keyboard pin header. However, there is a triple over here. So I'm just gonna check for an output voltage there to see if any of these are giving the LED voltage. Well, let's find out what happens when I power it on. Well, there's no pop, there's no bang. Let's check and see where the voltage is sitting. So there's five volts there with center negative. So taking our LED and popping it in with center negative, hopefully now we get a power light. So power light fixed. So let's get it back together. Well, it does appear that some of these screws are going into very worn holes because 
they're just not biting at all, unfortunately. So I will need to find some replacements for these. However, we can have a look at the GS. Now that it's back together for the first time since I've had it, and we can even test out the cartridge slot. There we go. Exceptionally tight fit, as it should be. Just wish the batch was on straight. However, next is testing. The big moment. Will it work? Will it not? It's connected up with the power. I'm currently using a component uh, lead bought from Amiga kit and the old cheetah bug. So let's see what happens. What uh, ROM is currently fitted in this? And it's a standard Commodore 64 ROM, so it's not the custom. GS64 ROM that we were hoping to see, but that kind of follows in with the fact that this may have been just a demo unit put together for stores. Obviously once you take one of these cartridges apart, then what you find inside is a very, very small circuit board, which once installed in here you've no access to, you've no way of removing and I believe what was in it was a 3-in-1 cartridge originally. So that stops people being able to steal the cartridge, obviously. Well, let's see if this modification to the top to allow us to use it more as an actual GS64 works. So everything's running so far. But I'm getting no audio yet. I don't know if this is normal, however, I would suspect not. And that could be down to my setup. It could be down to the cable. Nothing's been checked yet. no response from the joy port but again that could be this so let's swap cartridges just to make sure it's not a cartridge issue but I don't think so Now it is listed as C64GS as well, so hopefully that simply means that we can use this and it does look like the joystick is working. But we definitely have no audio. And <laughs> yeah, I'm getting nothing. This could be the controller still. It may not. Right, I'm going to pause just now. I'm more concerned about the audio. So I'm going to check the connections on the back of the TV. So after checking the connections on the back of the TV, it's definitely not the connections. So it looks like we may have an audio problem, which is fine, that can be resolved. Although I would have expected something more, I'll need to check with obviously the dead test cartridge, but I've got mine currently packed away and I can't remember where I put it, which is not clever. So in the meantime, let's have a look at the other two cartridges I've got there.
This one's Cyberball. I'm certainly not getting the fire for player one. It could be controller option. the second port just in case it's a port issue. There you go, it's a port. So there you go, it's uh, port one has an issue. So something else to look at. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing here. I don't remember playing Cyberball. So that's fine. And the last one we've got to check. is Ninja Remix. So press fire. Okay. Not quite sure what I'm supposed to do, and that's left, up, down. And right, does not seem to want to respond very well. So there we go, one Commodore GS64 supposed uh, store prototype, supposedly put together without the changed ROM, etc. Probably done quickly just to get them out for demo units to try and do some form of marketing by, by Commodore. Either that or it's a failed GS64 and somebody's just swapped in a different motherboard. Yet to recap it, hopefully that will resolve some of the issues, but we'll look at that another day. I'll dig out my dead test cartridge, which is currently packed away, and we'll see what it comes back with. So thank you for watching. I hope this was semi-informative, showing you a system that's not really that well known. Certainly, I hadn't seen uh, one in the flesh until recently. So thank you for watching again. Please remember to subscribe and like and see you on the next Retro Crazy.